In this video, I'm going to be talking about what actually works to treat hyperpigmentation. Plus, I've got a list of specific products and a skincare routine that's been proven to work. You don't want to miss this. In today's video, I'm going to be going into detail, detail about hyperpigmentation, specifically what causes it, why it happens, and more importantly, what ingredients and things that you can do to help get rid of your spots of hyperpigmentation. I've made it easy for you to navigate by including the specific timestamps and subsections below. From first glance, you might think that the skin is incredibly simple, but it actually isn't. It's quite complicated and fascinating at the same time. Our skin is broken down into three main layers. You've got the epidermis, which is on the topmost surface. Then beneath that, you've got the dermis, a deeper layer. And finally, a layer of subcutaneous fat. Within all these three layers, you've got a complex network of nerve endings, blood vessels, sweat glands, sebum producing glands, hair follicles, skin cells, the whole area. And they all managed to share this real estate and coexist together. I'm going to spare you the deeper anatomy and physiology lesson and just keep it simple at that. Within these layers of skin, we have melanocytes. Now this is where the action happens because melanocytes produce melanin and melanin is the pigment or the dye that gives us our skin color. Melanin is produced from the raw product, the amino acid tyrosine and tyrosine goes through a long complicated pathway which personally I don't really feel the need and I don't think it's that important to know the intricate steps but essentially in goes tyrosine from one end goes through a complicated sequence and pathway and out comes melanin and all this happens inside these melanocytes. So the analogy that I would use is that the melanocytes are the factories and in one end comes tyrosine, goes through a long chain, like a conveyor belt with lots of different things happening. And then the other end and the finished product is melanin. One of the key players in this melanin production pathway is the enzyme tyrosinase. And what it does, it has a role to play in converting tyrosine into melanin. And that's a key feature of a lot of the skincare ingredients and how they work to reduce hyperpigmentation. But more on that later. I mentioned earlier that we all have melanin, but how does this explain the variation in our skin tones and how some people are very fair and some people are very, very dark? I've got an answer for that. And that's to do with how much melanin that we have, how active they are and the type of melanin. We generally have the same amount of melanocytes. However, we know that these melanocytes are more active in people with darker skin. Did you know that not only do darker skins tend to have more active melanocytes and they make more melanin, they also produce a different type of melanin to those with lighter or fairer skin tones. Yes, that's true because there are two main types of melanin. That is pheomelanin and eumelanin. Pheomelanin tends to have a yellowish reddish pigment and it's more common in people with lighter skin, Caucasians, if you're fair skinned. Whereas eumelanin is a deeper brown blackish tone and is found in those of us with a darker complexion. It all adds up to give us that variation that has caused us to survive and thrive as human beings. And it adds to the beauty and the richness of all our skin tones. In normal circumstances, all this melanin that's produced is evenly distributed in your skin. And that's what gives you that nice, even skin tone. But there are times where this process is disrupted. And that can happen for a whole host of different reasons. Melanin cells are triggered and they produce more melanin than normal. And this tends to accumulate in a particular area, giving you that darker area of skin, giving you that darker patch. This is what we call hyperpigmentation. 
Hyperpigmentation can happen for a whole host of reasons. It can be as a result of a medical problem, an underlying um, issue that you've got going on. Certain medications can make this more likely to happen. Hormonal reasons, so if you have an underlying issue, being pregnant, that can cause it. And there is also hyperpigmentation that can happen as a result of a particular trigger or damage to the skin. And this is what we call post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation can happen for a whole host of different reasons. Most commonly is as a result of a skin condition or a skin issue. Things like acne, eczema, psoriasis, underlying skin problems that may have come and gone, but you're left with the dark marks and the dark spots. That is a leftover reminder of what you used to deal with. And it can be tricky to get rid of these dark spots in their own right. For me and many other people, another reason is as a result of cuts, scars, marks, bruises, things that you might have had as a child. Definitely, I fall into this category because I still have a mark on my knee, which is from when I tripped and fell when I was a child, playing out and being rambunctious. And I still, decades later, still have that scar as a visible reminder for what happened way back when. So that's another reason for post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation can be a real nightmare to treat. That's because it can happen out of a combination of different things. Some you might not have even been aware of were causing this hyperpigmentation. PIH can be quite tricky to treat for two main reasons. One, you have to figure out and treat the initial cause. And secondly, you then have to try and undo all that bad habits and the damage that was caused by the hyperpigmentation. So how do we treat hyperpigmentation? The first thing is that you have to be realistic. You are in for a long-term, even lifelong journey of treating the hyperpigmentation. But if you stick with it, your patience will be rewarded and you will learn lessons and educate yourself on taking care of your skin along the way. So that's the first thing. The second thing is you need to figure out what it is that's causing the hyperpigmentation. Just go back to the drawing board, try and have a think about what you might be doing and then start there. Obviously, if it's due to a hormonal issue, then that might be more tricky to treat and you might need to see a doctor about addressing that concern. And things like medication, like the contraceptive pill, again, I would suggest have a word with your doctor and see if those things are causing the pigmentation problems. They work in a variety of ways which is to do with that tyrosine melanin pathway. And they can either work as tyrosinase inhibitors, and tyrosinase is the enzyme that converts tyrosine into melanin. So they interfere with that pathway and with that enzyme. The second way is that they pretend to be tyrosine and they distract the tyrosinase enzyme and stop it from converting the real genuine tyrosine. The third way is that they increase the skin turnover and the turnover of cells and exfoliation so that you're getting rid of the old damaged skin cells a lot more quickly and revealing brand new, fresh, youthful, non-damaged skin. And the fourth way is that they stop or they interact with the transport or the transfer of melanin from the melanocytes up to the skin surface. But girlfriend, they do not bleach the skin. If you like my video so far, then why not let me know by hitting that like button and giving me a thumbs up. So the first ingredient I'm going to be talking about is hydroquinone. And you might be wondering why the heck is she talking about this? Isn't that unsafe? Da 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 da. Yes and no. The first thing is the facts and that is hydroquinone works. It's actually the gold standard when it comes to treating pigmentation problems. It works and it has a faster onset of action than a lot of the other products that I'll be talking about. So it works, it works quickly and it does what it's supposed to do. Often it can be given in a combination treatment with a steroid, a retinoid and together all these tend to give a lot of good results. 
That's not to say it doesn't have its side effects or its safety concerns. And a lot of people have talked about the risk of cancer, skin reactions, and ochronosis, which is a condition where you get this deep bluish, greenish discoloration to the skin. You'll see it when you see it, and you probably have seen that already. First of all, when it comes to the risk of cancer, okay, when you look at the research, yes, there is a risk of cancer, but this has only been found in lab rats. And the last time I checked, you're not a rat, I'm not a rat, so at best, this is just a theoretical risk and it's not been shown to actually cause cancer in humans. The other concerns can happen most definitely with skin reactions, skin irritations, and the ochronosis issue. But you usually find this when hydroquinone has been used incorrectly and has been misused. Usually if you're using it in excessively high concentrations, you're using it for a long period of time, and you're mixing it with other unsafe ingredients like mercury. And that's usually when you tend to run into problems. So it's for this reason that hydroquinone has to be given only under expert supervision. Here in the UK, it's unlicensed and you can only get it from a private dermatologist who monitors you and you're only really supposed to have it for a maximum of three, four months. Any longer, the effectiveness starts to kind of wane and you start to run into a higher chance of developing side effects and also there's the issue of rebound hyperpigmentation which is when your skin gets darker again rather than lighter so because we have other ingredients that do just as good of a job you might find rather than going through all the problems and the barriers with hydroquinone to stick with something that's far, far safer. The next ingredient is kojic acid. And this comes in various formulations, powders, creams, lotions, soaps. And the instructions for how to use it depend on which method that you're using. In low concentrations of around 1%, kojic acid is safe to use. And that means you can bypass all the concerns that you have with hydroquinone, for example. The thing about kojic acid is that it's a sensitizing ingredient, meaning that it has the potential to cause skin reactions, skin allergies, and contact dermatitis. This is a problem, unfortunately, that doesn't go away. So if you start using kojic acid and you develop redness, itching, rash, the best thing to do is to stop it. A lot of these reactions don't go away. In fact, they get worse the longer you keep using the product. And it can get as bad that you get really bad, severe reactions, and you may even need to go into hospital to get treatment for those reactions. So in this case, prevention is better than the cure. If you start using kojic acid and you develop any reactions, better to just avoid it and move on to the next product. Plus, kojic acid can also make your skin more sensitive to sunlight. So unfortunately if it doesn't work for you there are other things that will abutin is the next ingredient and this is also known as alpha abutin for those of you who are skeptical about hydroquinone you can use this because it's a natural cousin to hydroquinone the good thing about abutin is that it's safe to use in all skin types and skin tones but at higher concentrations it does have the potential to cause paradoxical hyperpigmentation which is that rather than lightening your spots it actually makes them darker so beware the next ingredient is vitamin c now before you start rubbing any old lemon or orange on your skin the active ingredient is ascorbic acid and this is an antioxidant what antioxidants do is that they help to cancel out the effects of free radicals free radicals are what's responsible for causing damage to the skin, signs of premature aging, and all the other stuff that you just don't want. Antioxidants work by neutralizing these free radicals so that they stop attacking the skin cells. Not only does it help to reduce hyperpigmentation, but it also helps improve the skin texture. It's an anti-inflammatory agent and also helps to improve collagen production all the things that we need for healthy, vibrant skin. Vitamin C needs to be formulated in concentrations of at least 5%
for it to be effective. But if you're shopping around and looking for a vitamin C serum, I would recommend to look for serums that contain around the 20% mark. That's really when we're in that sweet spot and we're going to get more effective results. The other thing about vitamin C is that as good as it is, it doesn't really do a lot on its own. And for you to get the most out of vitamin C, it's better for you to combine it with other ingredients, usually things like vitamin E or hyaluronic acid. These ingredients help to improve the effectiveness, the power of vitamin C and help it to penetrate into the skin better. You need to store vitamin C properly. This is because when exposed to light and air, it becomes oxidized and loses its effectiveness. You can usually tell when this has happened as what's supposed to be a normally clear liquid then turns dark brown. So make sure to store your vitamin C products correctly. They usually come in opaque containers that are either airtight, like an airless pump or a dropper bottle, rather than a tub or a transparent bottle. Azelaic acid is another useful ingredient and it's got multiple uses as well. It's also used as a good acne treating medication. It's a tyrosinase inhibitor and also helps to neutralize free radicals. It's available over the counter, but for you to get higher strengths, you have to get those on prescription. Overall, azelaic acid is a good ingredient, but it can sting, so beware. Retinoids or retinols are another widely used skincare ingredient and they have multiple benefits. They also affect that melanin pathway that I mentioned earlier. They help to increase the cell turnover so that you get rid of the damaged cells a lot more quickly. And when combined with other ingredients, they actually help to get those ingredients to penetrate better into the skin. So they're a really useful ingredient if you're not already using them. They're usually better used at night because of the issues with sensitivity to sunlight and there can be a learning curve for your skin to adjust. They can cause irritation, redness, even some mild peeling as well. So it's better to start with a low concentration and build it up. You might also find it starting off with maybe a couple of times during the week or every alternate night and gradually as to your skin tolerating them. However, they are one of the main products that I swear by. It's just that they don't work quickly usually around 18 to 24 weeks and that's about three months give or take or longer before you start to notice the effects on your skin niacinamide is another ingredient that's making the wave in skincare circles and personally i was a bit slow to get on the bandwagon and see it for what it is but it's another good ingredient that has multiple uses, not just in terms of hyperpigmentation, but skin texture, tone, firmness, all that kind of juicy, good stuff. Niacinamide is a form of vitamin B3 that can come from foods such as meat, fish, milk, eggs, green vegetables and grains. It's versatile and can be used for almost any skincare issue as it evens out the skin, it improves the skin texture, protects the moisture barrier, lots of juicy good stuff. So if you're not using it already, then be sure to consider it and add it to your skincare list. Chemical peels are a lot more powerful and a faster way to get results. So don't skip them if you're looking to make a lot of changes and improve your skin. What is a chemical peel? In short, there are higher strength exfoliants. They have lots of uses, so if you're not using them already, don't sleep on them because they do have a whole host of benefits. These include deep chemical exfoliation, treating hyperpigmentation, facial rejuvenation, unclogging pores, getting rid of acne, reducing wrinkles or scarring, brightening skin tone, enhancing the absorption of other skincare products, and so much more. In terms of chemical peels, there are three strengths of peels. You've got superficial, medium and deep. And this refers to how deep within the skin that they penetrate and how strong they can get. If you are new to facial peels and chemical peels, or you're just starting out in your skincare journey, then maybe it might be best to just start off with some of the other ingredients first and get a handle on things before progressing to facial peels. If you are going to use facial peels, I would use the ones that are available over the counter. Drugstore brands like The Ordinary, Nip and Fab, Paula's Choice, 
and start there before venturing into anything deeper. These brands have been formulated so that they're safe for general use, they're quite mild, and you're less likely to run into problems if you follow the instructions, of course. Do not, however, and I repeat, do not use medium strength or deep peels on your own. I would not advise that because you are really in danger, girl. Molly, you in danger, girl. There's much more chances of things going wrong. The other thing about peels is that you do have to have some downtime scheduling because part of what they do is that they stimulate the skin surface. So you can get redness, peeling, hence the name peel, and you then need some downtime. So if you've got a party coming up, which is unlikely in the current circumstances, but if you had a major event or you're going out for something, I wouldn't do a peel the day before, maybe give it a week, a couple of weeks beforehand to allow the skin's exfoliation to happen. Oh, and you also need to make sure that your sun protection game is on A1. Dermabrasion is another key thing that you can do for hyperpigmentation. Not only does it work for hyperpigmentation, but also for scarring as well, even deep dermal scars. However, you do have to go and see a professional so that they do the right thing and minimize any side effects. And it's recommended that you use dermabrasion in combination with a lot of the treatments that I've mentioned. For those of you who are late to the game, lasers are making waves in skincare. We have been using lasers for decades for lots of other skin issues, for tattoo removal, we've been using it for hair removal, for skincare issues, and it's only now that we're realizing that it has the potential to make a lot of benefit with hyperpigmentation. The problem with lasers was that when they were first developed, they were just not suitable for those of us with darker skin. There was a risk of scarring and hyperpigmentation. However, newer devices are making lasers more accessible to nearly everyone, regardless of skin tone. Pico lasers are the newest and most advanced technology when it comes to skin lightening and removing troublesome dark spots. There are different types of Pico lasers that use different wavelengths to remove the pigment, but the one so far that has the most effectiveness and can be safely used in dark skin is PicoShore laser. If you were to use anything else, then you run the risk of developing burns and scarring and definitely avoid anyone trying to sell you to use IPL. <coughs> Don't use that, sis. Don't use that. That is a problem. I wouldn't recommend lasers as a first line option. It's usually best if you've tried other methods and those things haven't been effective for you and after that you can then go and explore if laser might help. My advice when looking at laser treatments is to do some research and explore different options. Speak to different clinics and have consultations with different people. Make sure that they're explaining the process to you, that you understand what's involved before you go ahead. When it comes to skincare, it's very easy to start wading into complicated territory. Serums upon serums, creams upon creams, 10 step routine, this step routine, do this, do that, do everything. I just don't have time. Ain't nobody got time for this. So I'm gonna keep it simple. I've made things as basic as possible so that even I can follow along and it's much more likely that I will keep with it if it's something that's straight to the point. Personally, I like to keep within the cleanse, tone, moisturize limits. So the way I like to look at it is like a sandwich. And what goes into a sandwich? Well, you've got two slices of bread and then you've got the filling inside. So with your skincare routine, you need to make sure that you've got the bread and then you've got the filling. What's the bread? The bread is the cleansing. So that's this layer of bread. Then you've got the toning, which I actually look at as butter. And then you've got the filling, which is whatever you need to put in to treat your skincare issue. And then on top is moisturizing or SPF. So that's the final barrier and that's the final step so that your skin is protected and all the good work that you've just done in the last few minutes has not been undone. Your morning routine, we're going to follow the cleanse, tone, 
moisturize with any actives in between. Your cleanser needs to be gentle enough to remove any dirt or buildup, but still gentle. We do not want anything that's too harsh or stripping to the skin. Your skin should feel clean, but not tight or dry after cleansing. And I would recommend one of these products. That's the Inky List Oat Cleansing Balm, La Roche Posay Effaclair H Hydrating Cleansing Cream. Both of these are good drugstore options, which are reasonably priced. But if you're going to go above that, then you can also try Obagi Gentle Cleanser or IDS Clinical Cleansing Complex. The next step is toner. Now this is where I might diverge from some of the other skincare gurus out there. I know that glycolic acid cleanser, especially the Ordinary's glycolic acid cleanser has really good reviews and it works. However, I'm just a bit cautious because you're going to be layering some more actives on top. I don't want too many actives all working together to irritate the skin. So I've chosen toner that's just much more hydrating just to provide a base for any further actives. I've decided to use La Roche-Posay Soothing Toning Lotion, Elizabeth Arden Ceramide Purifying Toner, or if we're really going to go old school, you can just combine glycerin and some water. You can get this yourself in any beauty supply store, just pure glycerin and you make a mix of 50% glycerin with 50% water and apply that to the face or Boots do a good one which is gentle and that is Boots traditional glycerin and rose water. I just personally feel that by keeping as many things as simple as no fuss as possible we reduce the risk of getting reactions purging or irritation to the skin. So now that we've done that and we've created a good foundation, we can now start layering our products. So during the daytime, vitamin C is going to be king. And The Ordinary's vitamin C suspension, 23% and HA spheres, 2% is what I would recommend. And once you've done that, all that's left to go is a good moisturizer that provides a good barrier and keeps you moisturized during the day. And you've got a few options here. You can go with a very popular CeraVe moisturizing cream, or you can go really basic and use Cetroben lotion. I use this myself, even though it is designed for people with eczema, but it's actually a very good moisturizer and it's an emollient that has a lot of moisturizing properties. If you wanna go high-end, then PCA Skin Moisturizers Collagen Hydrator is another one that I've used and I would recommend. And lastly, but not leastly, is SPF. Your nighttime routine just involves removing the day's buildup of makeup, pollution, or any dirt, and then providing a good surface for all the nighttime actives to work. In the theme of making the most of my products and keeping an eye on my budget, I'm going to use the same products for cleansing, toning, and moisturizing. Once we've cleansed and toned our skin, now we're onto the big, big guns. Now we start using the actives. So you can layer an alpha arbutin, and from that you can choose the Inky List alpha arbutin or the Ordinary's alpha arbutin 2% plus HA, and then layer on top the Ordinary's niacinamide 10% plus zinc 1%. Make sure to leave enough time in between each product to dry and be absorbed into the skin before you put the next step. Once you've done with your actives, then you finish off with your moisturizers, same moisturizer as the one in the daytime. Personally, I don't see the need for using a different daytime to a nighttime. Skin is skin. Your skin doesn't know whether it's 9 a.m. or 5 p.m., whether it's Monday or a Friday. It just has its requirements for moisture, stabilization, and minimizing irritation. So I keep it the same. I keep it 100. I use the same moisturizer day and night. The last step which you might want to use, and this is an extra, but I have, and I swear by it, is to actually seal off with an oil. Oils generally don't moisturize or penetrate, but they work as a barrier to prevent moisture loss. And I find that the Ordinary's 100% organic 
cold pressed rose hip seed oil is the best it's light it's not thick or cloying and it just provides a really nice canvas for the skin and i use that just at night once i've packed on the other actives it does have a bit of a smell but to be honest this doesn't really bother me and i'm giving my skin all the nutrients and all the ingredients that it needs i'm doing right by my skin and you know it's not that big of a deal so that's your daytime weekday routine if you really want to accelerate your skincare then at weekends you might want to incorporate a facial peel i wouldn't recommend doing this more than once a week if you're starting out you might just even want to do it once every couple of weeks and start with a low strength chemical peel and as your skin gets used to it you can increase the frequency increase the concentration but really do it slowly 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 at every step what i would recommend is the ordinary aha 30 percent plus bha 2 percent peeling solution this has been doing the rounds and it looks to be very good another option is bravura london glycolic acid 10 percent peel what I would adv probably advise is that the night before you're planning to do the peel, not to use any actives and just give your skin a 24 hour period of rest. So if you're planning, so an example is if you're planning to use the peel on a Saturday, then the Friday before I wouldn't use any actives. I would just focus on cleansing, toning and moisturizing plus SPF in the day so that my skin just has some time to just rest before I attack it with a facial peel. And I will do the same on the Sunday as well. No actives, no acids on the skin. Just give it another 24 hour window before I start again on Monday. So my routine would be Monday to Thursday, AM, PM routine, AM, PM routine. Friday, just cleanse, tone, moisturize, cleanse, tone, moisturize. Saturday is the peel. Sunday, cleanse, tone, moisturize, and then start again on Monday. Let me know in the comments which part you found the most useful and which bits you're going to try out for yourself. And if you haven't already, make sure to like this video and consider subscribing if you found it helpful. And I'll see you in my next video. Take care, guys.